You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, delighted to be joined by Matteo Grassi. I hope I pronounced that right. Yeah, you did right, yeah. Excellent. The co-founder and CEO of Pop-Up. Matteo, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, pleasure to have you, man. Um, typical fashion of the show, discussed just before I hit the record button, early influences, then we jump into business and the fun stuff. No different with you. If my research is correct, you grew up in Italy, so rewind to your time growing up what was life like growing up in whatever particular part of italy you grew up in any favorite stand-up memories hobbies yeah i mean when i grew up i grew up in a, like a small town uh of italy like an entire small town um my parents were both artists so i was very influenced by the world of the arts you know from uh, you know music and singing and dancing and all that my dad is a pianist my mom is a is a singer Mm. And I started then to, uh, my studies actually then are mainly psychology, actually consumer and behavioral psychology. So I didn't become an artist like uh, my parents. And then I started to uh, travel. And um, the first place I moved to was actually New York. This comes down to kind of what kind of bothered me a little bit about Italy was the fact there was no opportunity or and the fact that people were fairly close-minded um, on um, on many topics especially like entrepreneurship or uh, what you want to do in life um, it feels italians are very much stuck in the traditions and they hence the reason why i don't live there anymore why did you pick america was that because of the movies that you saw a potential opportunity um, I wanted to kind of see the world and I thought that, uh, you know, living in uh, a place like New York would uh, basically be the quickest way for me to see the world <laughs> in a small contained environment. And uh, so, yeah, that's the reason why I moved to New York. I, and, I, and, that, and that was true because I met people from all over the world, you know, from uh, UK, Ireland, Puerto Ricans and, mm. uh, you know, African-Americans and stuff. And I remember... When I moved there, I was so shocked to see uh, a person of color uh, wearing a suit. This is actually how backwards Italy was, you know. I was, <laughs> I was like, I just saw people of color just selling things on the beach, you know, just uh, refugees or whatever it is. Um, I still remember that day. You mentioned your parents were involved in the arts. You did psychology. Uh, why did you pick psychology? I didn't actually very, I didn't do well in school. Like in high school, I barely passed. Uh, but the only class that I remember kind of stayed with me was philosophy. And during the philosophy class, we talked about Freud a lot and we started to basically have the basic on psychology. And I was just like so fascinated by him. And it was the only thing that I actually really liked and did well in high school. So I realized that I was excelling in things that I really liked and I wasn't really interested in everything else. So I felt like, oh yeah, let's, let's do psychology and kind of serve me right because I, I really aced through, through university. I think I finished a year early, top of my class and everything like that. I never worked in psychology after that, but I do realize how much it helped me in my marketing, for instance. And still today, my approach to marketing is very much uh, consumer focus and uh, behavioral focus. Looking forward to jumping into the business end of things. Before we move yeah. there, you mentioned the closed mindset around entrepreneurship in Italy. If you stick with your time growing up in Italy, people can usually point to a handful of people that had a massive impact on them in their early days. Teachers, parents, friends, acquaintances. Was, and, and, and what I mean by that is they had a massive impact on the early days that's helped them become the person they are today. Does anybody spring to mind for you? Yes, uh, my grandfather, because while my parents were very much involved in the arts, my grandfather was the only, not entrepreneur, but he held a pretty, not high position, but he, he had a very good career in like in a factory, um, any, any, you know, the energy company, it's a European mm -hmm. energy company, quite big. And he started really from nothing. I mean, my grandfather was like literally a farmer, sons of farmers, and then his dad died during World War II. Uh, so it was, you know, orphan as well. Mm -hmm. And basically it just went to school at night, put himself through, you know, university and everything like that and climbed the ladder. So he was the guy that was very much focused on a career, managing people. He had an own, his own team of 
over 20 different architects working under him. And I think seeing the the seeing him being successful, starting with nothing, that's what I wanted. You know, I, I, I wanted that. I realized that I wanted that and I can do that. What's your granddad's name? Uh, by oh Luigi. Well, shout out to Luigi. Um <laughs> A couple, a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe six or eight weeks ago, you put up a post on LinkedIn around uh, what was the most important lesson of the last 10 years or what were the most important lessons of the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. And in that, your answer was learning to let go. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, I think, I think learning to let go was referring to two things. Mm-hmm. People that had negative impact in my life that I knew they were dragging me down or they weren't pushing to pushing me to move forward. And I let letting go of those friendships and letting go of those relationships. And at the same time, letting go of the anger and frustration that I had towards my failures and towards my past business partners, for instance. Out of those two, hard to let go, uh, friendships and anger. What was the hardest? The anger. Because <laughs> the anger is within you. Friendship is easy, especially nowadays. It's like, you know, you decide to not to speak to someone anymore. You just stop speaking to someone. You know, you just go. I don't ghost people. I think I've been straight to people. But in some time, it's been like letting the relationship die anger is harder because anger is within you so anger you have to deal it on your own you can you can't just switch off your phone and deciding to you know ignore it uh, it's something that uh, you can't ignore you have to face and it's a long it's, it's it's a harder process for sure is that what took you to travel to kind of step back from a, from a while i know you went to india it was it 2016 yeah i went to india in 2016 i uh, know i love traveling it's like traveling has always been part of uh, you know who i am i think discovering new cultures and traveling the world is always, I just love, I love that change um, and moving around. I, I've been, I've done some, dig, I kind of say I can be in a digital nomad for a while, especially with my wife, you know, we're just living in different places every couple of months and we use Ireland as a base, but in reality, we, we do move, uh, move around quite a bit. Mm. Let's jump into business. You've built a couple of successful businesses, Viceroy mm-hmm. Group, for example. Yeah. Um, there's many blind spots when running and building a business and uh, not building the bench. So if someone leaves, you don't know who you're replacing them with not mm-hmm. having a culture of accountability or a hiring process, or even an onboarding process. When you look at other businesses that are in that kind of scale up stage, what are some of the blind spots that you see, particularly in this stage of the year or, or this stage, like 2021, 2022, that businesses repeat again and again and again, that you're like, for fuck's sake, if you just got your shit in order in this particular area, your business will be three to four times better. Yes. So what do I see a lot of businesses focusing on is, I guess, I, I don't know. I think remote work, it is the answer for a lot of ways in uh, scaling a business. Uh, I see businesses still, you know, going like, you know, spending money renting an office somewhere and just focusing on that and, focusing especially on trying to, for instance, uh, looking for developers or looking for hires and being so limited in scalability because, oh, I cannot hire the right people. I don't have enough budget, et cetera. And instead of just, you know, opening up and trying to hire from different sides of the world, and that's what served us very well to keep a kind of a lean structure. And uh, this is what I see sometimes, you know, like thinking, come on, open up, you know, it's like you can manage the team remotely. It's not easy because you have to face a lot of self-doubt as well, especially because you cannot see people inside the office and, you know, are they working or not? And you would think that most companies are very progressive, but most companies that I see, they still have, you know, the in-office structure, you know, they still prefer it. And as a manager and as a CEO or as an owner of a company, Managing a remote company is quite hard. You have to deal with a lot of trust issues that you have. You know, you're hiring people, you're not seeing them if they're working or not. It doesn't make much of a difference, to be honest. I mean, you can have someone that seems that is working in the office and maybe they're on Facebook all day. Mm. Um, so, but you have to change, I think, the, the, how the company is structured and really focusing on results rather than, uh, you know, how much time people are working. 
you've managed remote teams. If I was to say to you, uh, what's one tool for managing teams that you would not want to remove from the future? One tool that I would not want to remove. Um, mm -mm -mm. I have a mixed opinion with tools because I, I tested a lot of tools from different mm -hmm. companies because when I was in Shopify, um, Shopify taught me and my business partner, we, you know, he's, he's from Shopify too. And Kate as well is from Shopify. It was three of us like Shopify people. Uh, Shopify taught us to manage remote teams properly. And then I, we started Viceroy, we went, you know, remote as well, and then pop-up remote. And I think we use different tools from project manager to Slack to, uh, you know, um, Office Vibe, which is kind of manage the culture. One thing that I noticed is that tools help you a lot. And I think project management tools, they're all good. I mean, it, it depends how you use them. You know, Trello is great. We use ClickUp before we were using Monday. Uh, the development team uses Jira, so any project management tool I would highly recommend. Uh, some companies, most companies use Slack for communication. I have a friend of mine that is actually removed Slack from his organization, and they're just using uh, Telegram right now because they they realized that with Slack was creating a lot of bloat. I think the book that I read about remote leadership uh, and the reading that I started to do about how to manage a proper, uh, properly a team remote, that those are the things I would never throw away. And those are the things that I would recommend. In terms of tools, you have so many, you know, you have uh, so much choice. I think the hard thing is not how to use the tools, is how to change your mindset and how to act upon and how to use uh, and how to manage remote teams properly and how to create a structure, then what you're using is, um, it's up to you, whatever you prefer. For sure. You're now the CEO and co-founder of Pop-Up. You'll do a much better job of the 30 second commercial of what the business is rather than me. So the mic is yours. Oh yeah. yeah. So basically what we noticed is that the e-commerce blueprint has now changed since the nineties and we we worked in Shopify and we became merchants ourselves. So we've been a long time in the e-commerce. And what we realize nowadays is that a lot of merchants were trying to basically build uh, customer journeys. And they were using basically an array of apps and you know sometimes plugging things together and having very complex setup for very simple um, outcomes. And we decided to create a platform that allows you to create no-code customer journeys uh, and also manage an online business end to end. So we decided not to do an app that sits on top of Shopify because we found that that was the issue. It's like people, uh, there are problems in e-commerce or there's problems in Shopify or things that Shopify cannot do. And the solution has always been, hey, let's build an app for it. Let's build an app for it. Let's build an app for it. And we realized that there's just too many apps. And uh, so we decided to build the e-commerce platform end-to-end, uh, -end. so we have product management, uh, fulfillment management, orders, et cetera, and full-on CRM. And uh, we decided to build it in a way that can communicate with other e-commerce platform like Shopify, Magento, et cetera. So you can use it in conjunction via an order sync, but you can also use it as a standalone. I'll leave links to your LinkedIn page and the business page below in the show notes. Ping me if you want anything else. Put oh, on yeah, there. good. Um, but I have one question around e-commerce and it is um, I was shopping uh, two or three nights ago online. And uh, when I was on a particular website, it noticed where I was because it brought me to the .eu version of the website. It must have noticed that I was in Ireland. And um, so my question is, because I've not noticed many sites do this, more and more are starting to do, but still very few. How important do you think it is to localize each user's country as they purchase from a site perhaps you could give an example of like if it is a good thing to do or if it's not a good thing to do i i can i can tell you that one of our brands i mean in viceroy the one that we did we, we scaled to 40 million in revenue it was a very much a, a global commerce and a cross-border commerce approach we had seven different sites and they're actually doing what 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 really happened to you so if you're coming from ireland you were redirected to the eu site if you're coming from us to the us site uh, if we come from Germany, it was the German side. And the reason why we did this was two reasons. First, you want the users to have uh, a 
end-to-end uh, experience, a shopping experience that is relatable to his country. So you want to send them to, uh, I, let's say if you are coming from Ireland, you want to go on a site that is in Euro and you want to check out the Euro. You don't want the conversion from US to, to Euro. You don't want to see the you know, $19 and then you put the conversion that it looks like 17.77, you know? You want the 19 Euro or 18 Euro, 17 Euro. And the same thing you wanted on checkout. And to do that, you need to kind of create a different site. Also, you know, every country has is on some countries of different languages, like um, German, for instance, as you know, you have to localize in German. So that experience needs to be end to end. Another thing is like you're running promotions. Every country has different festivities, different promotion. Brazil, for instance, uh, Valentine's Day is in June. Right, it's not in April, in February. So it's like, oh. uh, yeah, it's some countries even like um, example like Australia versus US. You have winter in one country and then you have summer in another country. So you want to show different problem. Maybe you want to have a summer banner. I think it's like yes, you can do one site with currency conversion translated in different languages. It works, and you can use an array of plugins and etc but it's going to be very limited. I mean, the, the European users or the German user or whatever, they will know that is in a site that is translated. And what served us very well in our brand is like when a German came to visit our site, he thought he wasn't buying from a German company. And a lot of the times they were like, oh my God, I was surprised you know, when I got the invoice that your company is registered in another country because to me it was, you know, I was shopping in a German site. It kind of helps conversion for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk cross-border commerce as well, you also come down to payments. If you go in a country like Brazil, you cannot use uh, um, Stripe, for instance, or PayPal. They don't use PayPal and Stripe. Stripe is payment gateway that uses American acquirer. If you try to do that in Brazil, you're going to have a 50% drop of failed transaction. Brazilians pay with Boleto, which means that it's like um, going into the post office uh, yeah. to pay with things. They, it's, it's a cash payment that they do. So you want to work with someone like eBanks to localize the site and also localize the payment, uh, the payment integration, which means you need to have a separate site because you cannot plug two different payment gateways under the same, uh, under the same roof. It's either Stripe or something else. I had no idea of that. You, oh, yeah. <laughs> you must do some business or some friends in Brazil to know that Valentine's Day is in June and it's you <laughs> Stripe or PayPal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I, this is a mistake I did. I remember not in this business, in the previous one, we launched in Brazil with, the, with Stripe and we, we had like a 50% drop. We thought this, the site was broken because he had like 0.3% conversion rates. Yeah. And then we realized that uh, we needed to use a local payment, payment solution. So we started working with eBanks and then the business skyrocketed couple more questions for you have you got a definition of what success means to you yeah i think i think so i think i started to think that what success means to me meant to me and means to me today was it is to find what i'm really passionate about and to find my why and to find the thing that makes me wake up every day and I don't need to feel pushed or motivated or compelled to move my business forward. Yeah. And I always say it's a goal that can never be achieved. Because the moment that you put yourself for with achievable goals, you have two options. You're either going to achieve them and then a goal that is achieved is no longer motivating or you're not going to achieve it and then it's even worse because then you're just going to feel like crap. So for me, it was to find the thing that I can never achieve, which is helping others. Uh, by make them successful and the thing that we did with uh, with pop up was exactly that is creating a platform to help entrepreneurs and merchants etc to uh, you know create their own business and be successful i realized this when i was doing e-commerce and the the companies or the brands that i felt more passionate about were in the nutraceutical space because we were doing supplements and we were having these people saying oh my god you changed my life i started to take your supplements i feel so much better I'm sleeping better, I'm doing great, et cetera. And then in the past, I was doing, for instance, a drop shipping with fashion and we did like crazy money at the time. I mean, we did 1.5 million in one day, I remember. That was in with Viceroy, it was with another company. But honestly, it's just like the product were crap and people were not happy and we had all this money and I wasn't happy. So I realized that what really makes me happy was it is actually helping others. And I think this is the move from 
selling supplements or you know selling direct to consumer brands moving into pop up and creating the platform was i realized that oh my god i can actually do this on such a large scale i can help now everyone in the world to be successful online now this type of mission is unachievable i'm never going to be able to help anyone in the world to be successful online but the fact is unachievable it casts me going so i don't need you know the dopamine shots from the gurus out there telling me hey you know motivational content and all that stuff if you find what you're really passionate about you don't need that stuff it just it just naturally you're just going to wake up in the morning and be happy for what you're doing and the money will come and to me money i start to make more money when i start to do this rather than when i start to chase money <laughs> funny enough so i don't know what it's called in italy but like the school after primary i don't have a secondary school but kind of secondary like- school, yeah Secondary school, awesome. So if you, this is the final question, by the way, if you were in charge of adding a new mandatory subject to the secondary school curriculum, what subject would it be and why? Oh, what subject would it be? If um, if I had to add a subject in uh, secondary school, that's a good question. Never thought about this. <laughs> um I think coding, honestly, I don't, I don't think they're teaching coding. I don't think they're teaching no. coding in school. No, they're not. But my daughter is 10 and she's learning coding from an app. And I think it's amazing. It's through okay. games and things like that. Um, I think learning how to code is brilliant uh, because it's something that, it's the language of the future for sure, but it's also great from problem solving. Uh, every developers that I spoke to, they have amazing mind on problem solving because it's constant problem solving right and what taught me problem solving was studying latin um which i hated i hated latin with the bottom of my heart and then i failed in latin three times and then basically i was not going to pass the next year unless i was going to get at least the minimum in latin so i had to start you know learning latin seriously with with a kind of a private teacher on the side and things like that and she made me love Latin and I realized it was my teacher that um, didn't make me love Latin. And she put it like in, um, in more like the problem solving. And I really think studying Latin in my life because it taught me how to problem solve because Latin is, is that. It's like a puzzle of things that you have to try to put these sentences together, hoping to make sense. And when I was speaking with my friends or people that do coding, it's very, very similar. You're trying to kind of, it's constant problem solving or to find the best approach to, to the problem in the simplest possible way. Mm, I like that. Matteo, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. I'll leave links to everything below, but for today, we'll leave it there. And thanks again for being my guest. No, it is. It was a pleasure for me.